Claire Edwards from Brain Smart People Development, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you a conversation with wisdom and depth with Councillor Sue Baker on the topic of the essence of service and leadership. Sue shares how she transitioned from a career in learning and development to representing the city of Frankston in local government and how she drew on her years of experience in both hospitality and training to serve her constituents in the very best ways possible. Enjoy. I have more than a few serendipitous connections with my guest today including working in the same town many years ago when we were in the UK and a to and fro between countries over the years. Sue Baker is a councillor at the city of Frankston in Victoria, Australia. And how she came to get there is a story worth waiting for. But prior to joining local government, Sue had a long and successful career in learning and development. And when we started to chat about which leadership topic she was most passionate about, it pretty much came to a toss between community and service, uh, and service one. So our topic of conversation today is the essence of service in leadership. So a very warm welcome to Authentic Leadership. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for inviting me to join you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this topic. It's so, so, so important. So I mentioned sort of that's a story worth waiting for. So before we actually delve into you move into local government, going back in in your career, um, obviously, as someone who's also into learning and development, I'm curious as to what drew you into that world, that world of learning, development, training? Yeah, happy to um, cast my mind way back on that one, Claire. Um, <laughs> my, my very first role after graduating was in hospitality. Uh, and it was a, a very uh, but big national um, re- restaurant chain in the UK called Bernie Inns. And when I joined as an assistant manager, I was sent to oh, a week's management training uh, down in Bristol. And uh, w- the, the program was led by a woman uh, who was very dynamic, had some amazing, fascinating, intriguing stories about this whole thing called management. And I soaked up every moment of that week, listening to how you could work with people to really engage and support and develop and grow. And I thought, wow, no one's ever talked about that type of job in all the career counselling I've done and the career advice surveys that I completed at uni. So it really captured my imagination and I was determined to focus on getting to a position where I too could provide that sort of support and training to others. So that was the start of it. And from there, I threw myself into just a range of different roles in different industry sectors, just to get experience of Mm. organisations, of people, of leaders. And uh, so worked my way through hospitality, travel and tourism, airlines, retail, and even waste management, uh, and progressively got roles in providing training uh, in some of those organizations so that's how it started wow and uh, now that's eclectic I want to I want to ask you a, a, a question about that but just going back so funny a couple of things I'm picking up on um I got engaged in a Bernie Inn ah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you may have had prawn cocktail steak and black rice gatto on your <laughs> menu <laughs> it, it was exactly Exactly that. Um, actually, I didn't end up marrying him because I was only 18, but there you go. Um, and just listening to what you were saying about, you know, that that that, that was a few years ago, but the, how that experience stayed with you and linking it in a way to service be, because of the passion of that trainer, the stories that she had. And, and, and you know, you can you can still recall the sense of the experience. Yeah, I can even picture it. It was a large auditorium down at their head offices in Bristol. And I guess the sense of somebody 
really aiming to lift me up and support me and bring out my potential as opposed to telling me this is how you do it. Yeah. Being a technical review of how you cash up at the end of a session or do a stock take or do the ordering, you know, all those technical things that are very important in a leadership role. But it was all about how you as a person carried yourself, interacted and related to both customers and staff so it I say it was it was a real turning point in terms of how my career progressed from there wow and and you know I mentioned in the introduction about serendipitous connections so we, we both had early careers in hospitality and I remember chatting to you pre pod you know pre going live about the it certainly for me it wasn't until I moved into corporate that I realized what a fabulous grounding we'd had in customer service and teamwork in hospitality so when when I left uh, the hotel chain I was working with and went into corporate I was a I was a, a little bit shocked that was just my experience of that lack of sort of passion for service and so coming back to what you were, you were sharing then about the variety all the different uh, industry sectors that you've worked in. What what was your experience and, and maybe even sort of you, 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 your collective learnings from how service was focused on in those different sectors? Yeah, so from Bernie Inns, I went to work for Thompson Holidays, who back in the day were the number one uh, tour operator in the UK mm. and I worked both in reservations and then in their customer complaints department so in terms of service had some very different experiences and learnt a lot again about working with customers in a range of different scenarios and it was whilst I was at Thompson's that I had the opportunity to think about going to work for British Airways they were going through privatisation at the time and it was probably a little bit of a hedonistic part of me that said well you never had a year out after you completed your degree (laughs) to go travelling the world why not Uh, and also it's a different sector it'll give you huge exposure to people again so I applied and I think within weeks had been accepted so then spent three years working with British Airways to flying and then I took up a secondment to go and work in their sales and customer service training department, mm-hmm. which was all about looking at a, an online program that they had for the travel industry. And then about six months into that, looked at setting up a subsidiary training company for British Airways. Mm-hmm. So I was in a really cool spot, right time to get involved in thinking about the commercial aspects of setting up a training business Mm -hmm. in a phenomenal organisation surrounded by some incredibly talented people. And that's what we did. We set up um, a training uh, subsidiary company that at the time was called the Academy of Travel Management. I then decided that I was at a point where I really did feel I had enough to offer the training world as opposed to the managing of a business world. And Mm -hmm. my company was around training. Um, And at the time... Our BA was still very seniority based and I didn't have enough seniority in terms of years to to do the sort of training that I really aspired to, which was the supervisory management leadership. So at that point, I took up a role um, with uh, the Dixons Group, uh, again, national retailer in the UK and worked for their service arm uh, and had uh, three years working there so that's that's how the eclectic nature of my (laughs) career starts to build and from Dixon's had the opportunity to go and work in waste management um, for Biffa another leading organization so I feel very privileged to have worked with some great brands in the UK Mm. different sectors all giving me the opportunity to build my knowledge, experience, practice of uh, management, leadership, now both delivering, but also now developing my own teams of trainers uh, in those areas. Having had that breadth of experience and and 
you know, I'm not sure to what degree um, you had direct access to, to to the leadership and the leadership culture, but I'm curious, were there, was there a sort of correlation or an alignment between the culture of service to the consumer or the end client and the leadership culture of the spirit to serve? Culture is a really fascinating subject uh, and has I guess doing my training at work became more of more of greater interest to me as, as mm. that progressed working with British Airways when it became a private organization opposed to government run the culture shift was phenomenal and was a significant piece of work for the organization so mm. being part of that new wave of employee at that time I experienced from the inside uh, looking out to how that was being managed and how that was being facilitated and was part of that experience so the link between the senior management the board right through to the frontline staff and through to customers is imperative when yeah. you're talking about service values and inculcating a culture which really is focused on giving great service. I then carrying that experience uh, along with the training that I picked up in the sales and customer service team, I moved into Dixon's and I think the service industry, the service wave was really starting to gain momentum across a, a range of industry sectors by that stage. Mm -hmm. And I remember being involved in a group who were looking at the culture of the Dixons group as a whole, working with some external consultants who were doing a lot of great work to introduce an approach, again, to do similarly. How do we cultivate great relationships internally and then also externally to bring around about a change in, in service style mm. and culture? And fascinated, loved working with them all. And then one day, the um, owner of Dixon's Group at the time made a press release about how proud he was that his products sold themselves. And in that ah. single moment, <laughs> seemed to pull the rug out of ah. anything culture had to do with the people, the sales assistants, the managers, the leaders. The it was it was quite a phenomenal moment I think for me in terms of understanding how important that link between senior management's values yeah. and perspectives and how that filters through the organization here was someone saying that the products could actually sell themselves because they were so good um, which really then undermined um, all the work that was being done to support people individuals relationships within the organization and that was that was pre Daniel Goleman and emotional intelligence. Oh, completely. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh, some brilliant stories there, Sue. Thank you. So, coming sort of a little more up to date in your career, a transition from uh, learning and development into local government. I. <laughs> I don't see that too often. And I'm fascinated. I'm curious. How did that happen? Well, when you and I chatted uh, before today, I think we both talked about moves internationally, globally. Yeah, yeah. Moving countries. We talked about different reasons for moving jobs, uh, changing slightly career directions with opportunities that are presented. And I think my... CV makes sense when I look back to, back on it. Um, I probably wouldn't have predicted myself some of the things that I've done uh, mm -hmm. when I was planning looking forward. Although the, the, the strong themes have always remained the same, you know, service, people development, uh, working with change. So the move to local government came at a time, uh, it was in 2020, I, ah, the yeah, famous year. The famous <laughs> year, the famous COVID lockdown year, uh, living in Victoria, in Australia as well. I had just moved here from a couple of years up in Sydney, 
mm-hmm. and family reasons have brought me here and I was planning to look for work uh, here in, in Melbourne and work much closer to home. I've done lots of national international roles mm. and I wanted to be closer to home and uh, that was my plan. March arrived of 2020 and the talk of COVID was starting to gain momentum. I went to a local morning tea as a new resident and had the opportunity to meet the mayor mm-hmm. and was just chatting to her about my aspirations. I was a recent recent arrival into Frankston and the more she talked to me and was asking me these very um, inquiring questions about my background, she suddenly said, well, I, I think you should run for council. <laughs> and I said, well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, we, we have local government elections. You've said you were looking at uh, some executive roles on council. I, I think you have the skills that would make a great councillor. And we have elections later this year in October. Why don't you run? Uh, anyway, so that was very left field. And yeah. uh, I thought, well, I can do some research on this. We then went into lockdowns. Uh, I was applying for some roles, but that whole landscape was morphing as yeah. the organisations were starting to realise what that would mean for their structures and mm. workforce. So I, I did my due diligence. I started to look at council meetings. I'd sit in when they were running or being uh, run by Zoom and live streamed. Mm-hmm. I spoke to a, another friend who had supported Emily's List, which is a, an organisation that supports women into local, state and federal government. She said, I think it's a great way to get them to know your community soon. <laughs> Go for it. And so, yes, I finally decided that I would throw my hat in the ring. Why not? It seemed to hit all the things that I was really passionate about, people. Mm. And I'd have 142,000 customers. Good governance, uh, you know, setting up and being interested in the way organisations function, how they they deal with change, uh, working with a new team of people. Yeah, it seemed to have all the all the things that I was really passionate and interested in. So I, I yeah, I threw my hat in the ring and um, got elected. Wow, I've, that's bringing up so many more questions. So we're in lockdown. Everything's happening virtually. You're not yet known in the community and you get elected. (laughs) How, in terms of sort of, um, I suppose, pre-purchasing service in commercial terms, how did you engage with and and influence the the, the people who had the vote to, to trust you to come on that journey with them? Yeah, so that's interesting and I've been reflecting on it recently because I'm supporting uh, a group of women who are thinking about standing for election in 2024. So my campaign story is quite unique um, along with all the other candidates that campaigned in lockdown because there was no door knocking, there was no Mm. going to community events to introduce yourself and talk to people. So I did a number of things. I engaged uh, my son, a millennial, to help me with um, social media and set up a Facebook page, uh, an Instagram account. I started to do regular posts. Um, I used Clips, which is uh, an app which enables you to do voice to camera with subtitles, little short videos. Oh. I posted a lot of those out you know cycling around our local wetlands or in front of um, key restaurants or coffee shops that were doing takeaways I got some posters and put them in all the open shops at the time and did um, shout outs to all of those business owners as part of my campaign I joined a group of people who twice a week had online meetings which was streamed through Facebook and for an hour or so we'd chat to another person in the community who might have been president of a sports club interested in flora and fauna would talk about our biosphere um, the wetlands all sorts of different aspects of our community so again 
all of us as candidates were finding ways to get known, mm. seen, be heard, mm. and listen to how we asked questions, how we shared our views, what our views were. So those were the sorts of mechanisms that uh, I used to get known. I had a phone number so people could call me, which a number of people did. So we chatted about individual matters and, again, my views on things. Um, Yeah, so those are the sorts of ways of getting out there. Yeah, and um, actually, can I ask... Were you were you surprised when you got in, or were, uh, you'd done so much work that you were fairly confident? Oh no, I was definitely <laughs> surprised. I was definitely. Surprised. I guess I was engaged with the whole process at that point. Yeah, it was like I've run many projects with many organisations, um, and particularly as a consultant um, for a big portion of my latter career. Mm. So once. You'd set the plan, set the goals, had had that all in train, had people supporting me with the various aspects of the campaigning. You know, I, I threw everything into it and committed myself to it. Yeah. However, I recognised I was new, unknown, and there were a number of people re-standing for election, people who were well-known in the community. So, yes, I was pleased to be in the in the running very pleased to be in the in the game Mm. um, but then delighted I think my first preferences so the initial count so it was split into two halves there were two closing times there was the um, actual voting and there was a postal votes had two cutoffs I think that was what it was and uh, anyway after the first round I was lying about fifth out of 10 or 11 so I thought, oh, okay, well, that's not bad, but it's still not one of the top three and I need mm-hmm. to be in the top three. Anyway, after the second count, and I think along with preferences from other people who didn't have enough to, to push them through, I came third and that was clearly enough to, to be elected wow. to the Northwest Ward. Congratulations. <laughs> and, and, and can I ask that sort of, it sounds like when you listening to all the um, the actions that you took, the strategy that you took was a service based approach. So, so what did you draw on from your years in in all these different industry sectors? To and I, I'm making an assumption here, but to, but to create this service based approach to this new opportunity. One of the really key skills in learning and development in service, I think, is being able to listen, Mm. you know, really hear what people are saying before coming back with your response or your agreement or your, you know, your alternative view. And I've done a lot of what I would describe as really deep listening in my career and that's what I think and know now I've been a councillor, I'm in my third year now, I know is really important uh, in, in this role, really being able to listen. So my proposition uh, as a candidate was that I would bring uh, experience, compassion and commitment to the role, not about any particular policies or changes, because as a councillor group, you there are nine of you that need to make decisions. I don't make decisions on my own. So yeah. for me, it was talking about what I would bring. So listening, really important. Having a perpetual curiosity for everything that comes across my path uh, and an interest. So even if it's perhaps not something that I would naturally be drawn to, there's still someone who has a deep interest in, and passion in that mm. topic or in, or area or community group. Uh, so I've, I believe I've learned to ask questions that then reflect that curiosity and interest to really understand the who, what, when, where, why, why, how yeah. uh, aspects of, of someone else's life. Good governance and, you know, well-managed projects 
even if they're reviewed, need to change direction, but good governance, good feedback loops, clear KPIs, uh, great ground rules about how you're going to work together, all, all of those things, yeah, many yeah. projects, I believe are really important in this role. So again, that that skill, those skills that I'm, I have learned and I'm still learning because I'm in a different environment now, I think are really important. And I've had many lived experience in a variety of communities in different places where I've always done some sort of volunteering. So building relationships with local groups has always been important to me. So, yeah, those are the sorts of skills I've, I, I was wanting to bring to this role, knew I could bring to this role and hoped people would see would hold value. I'm, I'm writing these down as you're saying them, you know, deep, deep listening, um, a focus on experience, compassion and commitment rather than policy and procedure, perpetual curiosity, the, the, the quality of the questions that you ask, the governance, the feedback loops, KPIs, great ground rules, which we, you know, as um, as facilitators, we always set that to start with when we're, when we're working with groups. I see a book in there, Sue, to be honest with you. <laughs> they're, seriously, they're, they're such essential attributes for, for leading with service. And I just want to pick up on something that you said earlier. Uh, 142,000 customers how on earth I mean you can you can listen deeply but I mean by the time you know I know this is sounding flippant but seriously how do you serve or or create a sense of service with such a a wide uh, cohort of, of clients yeah, that's uh, an interesting and very broad question mm. to respond to. What what I've what I'm learning about local government is there is a commitment to what's called deliberative engagement. So it's really important for the council to have engagement practices and approaches. So when let's say, uh, a new policy is go- is being considered. We've got currently something on our parklets and outdoor dining, uh, mm-hmm. how we handle that. But when that goes out to the community for feedback, we're clear about what we're asking, what we want them to comment on, how they can provide their feedback. So there are some good processes within local government for doing that and a lot of it is done through social media Mm. some projects require letter drops so a community would get notes through their door saying this is what we're considering what are your views Um, so there are a range of engagement practices as a councillor I would then come to council meetings I'd have various briefings on how that's progressing uh, and ultimately make decisions based on feedback uh, at, a, at a council meeting in addition to that though in my ward and there's three wards in Frankston mm-hmm. um, there is the opportunity for residents to reach out by email or phone to say can we have a chat about this or I'd just like to give you my views. I don't necessarily want to have a chat, but I'm I'm sending you information about my views on this topic. So there is a lot of information constantly coming in, both to the council group, but also to individual councillors. And then as a group, we we will talk to each other on issues that are of particular importance to to those of us um, maybe in the ward or across the, the community. Um, And that's great too. So you can bounce Mm. ideas off people who have different perspectives and and different ideas about that that one topic. And yeah, and and I think with um, with a you know with one hundred and forty two thousand people, you're going to get such a a a, a vast um, or variety of opinion opinion what have you. So how do you 
turn this from a if we're thinking I'm, I'm trying to find my words like there's a continuum so so on one end it's a consultative process and you would tick the box to say you know we've told the community and we've got processes for feedback and then right at the other end of the scale is that I suppose deep listening in a way to 142,000 people and that deep engagement or where possible a, a process of co-creation I suppose where where would you sit on the continuum or what, what would the objectives be and the, I know this isn't sounding particularly clear but I'm, I'm curious to understand more about the process so that so that your constituents feel heard and it's not just a process yeah exactly and again it's a very big topic and it's a very big area um not all 142 people thousand people would comment on everything we put yeah. out for yeah yeah so, <laughs> so that, that uh i mean that would raise all sorts of other questions if they did and but however you know as a council we're really keen for people to get involved um we do have as a framework something called iap2 oh yeah which um, is a, a framework for at one end saying, you know, there are five, five areas in IAP2, which is a framework for public participation. And at one end, it's about informing people, telling them what you're doing. And some items, it is, it is merely about doing that because it might just be a change or an update or an upgrade. But that framework goes right through to co-design, where you are really working with a group to get all views so in a way you're sharing that responsibility of design and creation in response to an issue I think that's the harder thing to do the harder way to work for Mm. um, more many organizations including local government and we're very much on a learning curve to do more at that end of the the framework of the spectrum of IAP2 at the end of the day, that's the, the, the big responsibility for councillors to, to make decisions where you know not everybody is going to be 100% happy with the outcome. However, what's really important to me is that you tie decisions back to the council plan, which is uh, set for, for four years and reviewed yeah. every year to make sure we are still meeting community needs. The community is invited to give feedback on how we're tracking on that. There then are situations that arise currently, you know, interest rate rises, cost of living pressures, Mm. budgets and a range of needs within the community that might influence where we divert funds or money or time and effort. So making decisions needs to tie back into both the, the longer term plan, the short term needs, um, funding, and and what the criticality is of issues. So there are a range of mm. factors that are moving sometimes all the time, but sit within a framework of what we're aiming to achieve for the municipality as a whole. Mm. And and you mentioned, I remember when we were chatting earlier. It's it's like a, an it, an iterative process. Yes, it, it is sometimes, and I think. We're constantly, as a group of councillors, getting information in, which, you know, we've certainly had experience where we initially look at an issue and think, oh, yeah, I know how I feel about that. And I've got a sense of how the community feels about that. That's how I will vote on it. And then more information comes in, more conversations with residents. Maybe our consultation process provides more information with residents who also then change their views about how they (laughs) originally thought they yeah. the situation and now they're saying oh I'm not so sure I, th- I think I need more information to help me decide on what I really believe is the right thing to do here so yes the, the, the service conversations the service dynamic is ever evolving and iterative which makes it both interesting but often mm. you know also challenging yeah and linking link, linking this back now to leadership so many conversations I'm having with leaders at the moment is this 
you know, verging on burnout because the demands on them to be so much to so many people and, you know, that they're, they're struggling with it. I suppose the, the energy and, and the resources to keep that focus on service. And I don't know if you've been in that position yourself before, but if you were to reach out to them and offer a, 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 a guiding hand of advice, what might that be? I think it might sound cliched in some respects, but this notion of taking care of yourself first, mm. you know, often the oxygen mask on a plane is used as the analogy, you know, in order to help other people in the event of an emergency, you absolutely have to get yourself in a good position mm. first, and that might be putting your oxygen mask on. I do think that's really more than ever important to carve out some time for yourself to walk, eat well, have some social time with friends, family. That's really important. What's helped me over the years is uh, developing my interest in mindfulness and Buddhist psychology. I feel that's really helped me in terms of being in the present moment, um, not worrying and wondering about the what ifs of what happened yesterday or the last meeting or the last encounter on mm. something, but knowing that I've got this moment to make the optimum decision, ask the right questions, meet the right people, talk to my colleagues, peers, and that's going to influence the future rather than hypothesizing how it might look and what will happen and I've I've found for me that focus on this moment actually means it often really expands that might sound a bit crazy but um, no 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 it doesn't it's it it really helps to stay focused on what's important and I think is helpful in terms of um, dealing with any sense of burnout or stress um, and I think, you know, as well, leaning on other people. We don't have all the answers. We don't make all the decisions in isolation. There are other people to talk to, same opinion, different opinion, who have the expertise, who have resources, who have ideas. And I think, you know, remembering that we're all in this together is, is really important too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> one of the workshops that I run on self-care, I actually call Serve Yourself First. And mm -hmm. and yes, it is a, a cliched analogy, but uh, particularly you haven't worked for BA. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a, 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 cr a critical one. And so thinking about, um, if I understand the process correctly, moving forwards the 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 cycle is a four-year cycle for you is it it is yeah yeah local government uh, councillors are elected every four years so I would think that having that that ability to be mindful and stay in the present is pretty important but there will be a time in the future where <laughs> there's a significant decision that may not be in your hands it, exactly um and it, Next year is next year. I'll, I'll make decisions on that then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think it's somebody, I spoke to somebody recently who, when asked, would you, would you stand again for local government? Is uh, Have you enjoyed your first term so far? And they said, you know what? I'm not going to make the decision. I'll let the residents make the decision. And uh, if they want me to stand again, then that, that will be the, yeah. the way to progress it. Yeah. That while you're walking, you talk. So can I ask, sort of, a, 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 again, sort of looking back at this wonderfully a, a diverse, eclectic career that you've had, what has been the most challenging and what has been the most rewarding? Is that a question for my entire career or is that just for the... However you want to respond to it, however you want to respond. Actually, probably... Um, yeah, I'm thinking maybe, yeah, maybe the last three years. No, it's up to you. It's up to you. 
Um, I think in terms of rewards, and, and maybe they do span both this role and other roles, um, the rewards are in, in taking a service leadership role, which for me is all about supporting everyone around me to be lifted up, realise their potential, um, be supported in the ways that work for them. Seeing those people really do well and succeed and thrive and, and make the changes for themselves that they really want, that they're, that's really rewarding for me. Mm. And knowing that I might have played a small part, you know, an introduction, uh, a comment, um, some shared experiences that, that all of that I think is you know gives me a great deal of satisfaction um, I've, I've had access certainly in the council role to every aspect really of how a municipality runs and if, and if I think about the organizations that I've worked with and it has been eclectic and many and varied that's been a real privilege to yeah. have the inside view on the opportunities and challenges organisations face and, again, be a part of the conversation to how they can realise what they're working towards. Um, and and with, with council, what I was going to say is I've, I have the opportunity to work on a variety of committees. So at the moment, I'm working on the Audit and Risk, um, a Housing Advisory Committee, our Reconciliation Action Plan group and our Disability Access and Inclusion group. So just by listing listing those areas, those are my areas of interest. And again, having the opportunity to be at the table mm. to discuss with people and invite people if they're not at the table to be part of those conversations is very rewarding. Um, and I... Yeah, I'd like to think I, I use that um, opportunity sensibly uh, and wisely because it is a big responsibility. Yeah. And the challenges? Oh, the challenges. <laughs> oh, there, are, there are equally as many and varied, I guess. The challenges are, I mean, I tend to have a half cup, half full outlook. Mm -hmm. um, rose tinted glasses um, <laughs> I think when I used to travel between the UK and Australia to come and do some work here um, my brother used to say to me oh you, you talk about it like you're getting on the number nine bus to get into town <laughs> said, well well it is you know I, I it's um it is a challenge and if I sat and thought about the difficulties of travel and time zones then um then I might not do it uh, the challenges are, you know, not not everything goes your way. You know, there mm. are disappointments along the way. You you meet people who don't lift you up or support you or aren't even interested in doing that. You know, there are, you know, you have health things, you have family crises. There's things in your life that happen that throw throw spanners in the works, and you know, you need to change direction to accommodate that so for me those are the sorts of things that are the real challenges with yeah. with my career I guess then you you know you push through and live through and work through and revert back to leaning on other people mm. and friends and family and um, reset and continue and I've had some fabulous role models uh, leaders uh, in my life who you know have supported guided encouraged challenged me and I, I reflect back on those times and those people and that then supports in those more difficult times yeah there's a there's a, a common thread there of of support and, and encouragement and actually one of the questions sort of around that and listening to you speak and your stories there's there's always been that sense of connection to community you're talking about your volunteering experience and that that insatiable curiosity and we have you know we have a cohort of of 
young emerging leaders or even on the other end of the scale, leaders who've been in a, a leadership career for many, many years. And f- for many, either a sort of command and control approach has been their their go-to way, or, or maybe they have been subject matter experts, they're technically, they're brilliant, and then they've been given this this advancement opportunity, which is managing people. And they're struggling with this spirit to serve because it's not uh, not innate to them. And I suppose I'm just asking really for you, for your opinion on this. Do you think it's possible for people to change and to learn to uh, love that part of their leadership role? I think what helped me think differently about leadership was experiencing different leadership role models. Mm. Uh, It's one thing to teach people or read case studies about different ways of of working. Um, And the command and control style, it's very technical. It's... um, it doesn't talk about the emotional intelligence, the impact people have on uh, relationships if there's no empathy or compassion or interest or care. It doesn't talk about issues of trust, which are fundamental to all relationships. It doesn't talk about commitment to other people's goals equally to commitment to your own. And I think you need what helped me was experiencing that yeah. um, from other leaders. So, and I think, I think as well, operating in a service leadership does come with perhaps some experience of realizing that you can loosen your grip on everything, let go a little. Um, I remember many years ago, someone said to me, "If you hold on too tight, you'll get rope burn." You know, oh. just just loosen your grip, invite other people in, share in the goals. You know, the, the, there will be many different views and opinions, but actually that's that's what helps the richness of a decision and the richness of an outcome and the richness in implementing mm. things when you've got a service mentality, a community mentality. You might get results, command and control, but you won't see how many people you're disaffecting. You won't see how that's undermining trust. So there's a choice to be made in there about um, how you want your legacy to be viewed and your, your style. And again, I think, you know, situational leadership will tell us there are times when certain types of leadership are undoubtedly needed. Yeah. (laughs) So You know, it's not to say that a a service leadership style is necessary in all Mm. situations. I think we experienced that in March 2020, didn't we? We did did. need a little bit. (laughs) We needed a little bit more direction. (laughs) So that was the that was such a I think a wise wrap up to our conversation, and um, I love the rope burn analogy. It's Mm -hmm. uh, it's so important. It's been such an insightful conversation and thank you you know staying true to the whole raw authentic philosophy you have been raw you have been real you have been authentic um and i'm deeply grateful for that for the time that you've given us and for the wisdom that you've shared so thank you and thank you claire for your questions which have really got me to think and reflect and Um, So I appreciate the time chatting with you too. Thank you. Go well, Sue. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. And we hope that this conversation provided the insights and inspiration that you were looking for. Authentic Leadership is currently ranking fourth in the top 25 Australian leadership podcasts. We'd love you to help us get to number one and to get the key messages about modern day leadership out there. And this is how you can help. Head over to Apple iTunes and do three quick things. Subscribe, give us a positive rating 
and write a short review. Also, if you can follow us on Spotify and subscribe to the podcast on YouTube by visiting the at Being Brain Smart channel, we'd really appreciate it. And before you go, if you'd like to know what I do when I'm not interviewing amazing guests, I help people in business to lead better, work smarter, build great teams and thrive in change. To find out more, head over to the Brain Smart website. That's brain-smart.com to see examples of our programs or email me, Claire, that's C-L-A-R-E, at brain-smart.com. Go well and thanks for listening.